Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's afternoon here in Johannesburg. Uh, my name's Sam Chalice. I'm the uh, head or acting head of the Rock Art Recent Research Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand. And um, ordinarily, um, our postdoc, uh, David Whittleson, would be uh, comparing this, but it falls to me today because he is away and I'm here at WITS. David is online. Um, and uh, we're continuing with our 2023 RARI seminar series. And we're very fortunate today to be joined by um, an ex WITS uh, colleague and a current uh, Rock Art Research Institute Honorary Research Fellow in the form of Dr. Yanni Loebscher, who did his PhD in archaeology at, at WITS University uh in the 80s and that was on um it's into uh language speakers archaeology and then he but he always had an interest in rock art then he moved across to the world of rock art um when in the same year that he got his phd he also graduated in rock art conservation at uh university of canberra and his uh, his conservation work is something that he continues to this day and i've been to a couple of sites in the us that Yanni has worked on, especially with things like graffiti cleaning and that kind of thing. So uh, that's another string to his bow. Um, he began, he started, he founded the rock art department, at the National, Mu National Museum at Bloemfontein, where he, and that was in 1987, and he worked there for a long time with other people that you may remember. Um, I don't know if Sven is actually online with us now, but uh, people like Sven Usman, um, and then G Gabriel Clarpy joined Sven there, and the whole thing's carried on. That's where Shiona Moodley is now. So there's a good there's a good tradition of rock art at uh, Bloom as well, thanks to Yanni. And then in 1993, uh, Yanni emigrated to the US, where he worked as a contract archaeologist for New South Associates before starting his own company, which is how I know him these days, and that is through Stratum Unlimited, where that where he does contract rock art. Uh, work, including the conservation work that he does, but a lot of recording all over the US. And that was in 2006. Uh, so he does he does the archaeology, he's, he excavates because he's a fully fledged archaeologist, of course. Um, and these are, this is contract work for government agencies um, in, 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 in all of various states across the United States and further abroad. So with that background, I shall hand over to Yanni. Hopefully on this side, Yanni, we're going to be able to hear you here. You have got the volume turned up full. Um, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Well, thanks for having me, Sam and David and um, the two Davids. Uh, it's kind of strange, you know, as an alumni to speak to students at WITS after so many years. But anyway, these things do happen and I really appreciate it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is basically the work that I've been involved in in the southeastern United States and uh, particularly petroglyphs and pictographs. And uh, as you probably know, petroglyphs in South Africa is a name uh, that's differently called. It's uh, they people refer to them as engravings, even though uh, these petroglyphs also include a lot of pecked images, a lot of incised images, and a lot of abraded images. So under that rubric of petroglyphs, um, it's kind of a neutral term. You'll get the, the engraved rock art. Uh, then pictographs are the where pigment is applied to the rock. It's 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 an additive process as opposed to the extractive process of, of petroglyphs and pictographs include paint that's applied to the rock or pigment that's applied directly to the rock um, in a dry form so the paint usually involves mixing with water almost invariably and then sometimes with mediums and uh, then the dry methods would be just using a chunk of ochre or maybe an ochre pencil or a piece of charcoal or some other colorant that uh, people then add to the rock. Now, these two terms are preferable to just the word rock art here in the United States, and I suspect certain parts of Australia, because some of the indigenous people, the Native Americans, uh, they 
seem to think that rock art is not always an accurate description. They don't have a term for it, as far as I know, in their languages. There are many, many languages here in the USA. And uh, so I would say that petroglyphs and pictographs are neutral terms. They agree. Some of them refer to these uh, things as rock writing or rock images. So, um, but I know rock art is something that kind of resonates with a larger audience. And uh, for that reason, I think a lot of people, most researchers stick to that term. But I think we should just be cognizant that say, if you go and work with the Sun and Paiute, uh, if, you ter if, you, if you use the term rock art, they will uh, very politely uh, tell, tell you that, you know, it's actually rock, rock writing in their language. The, I'm going to talk about four different types of rock imagery in the area. First, I will talk about the open air petroglyphs, the pecked and in, engraved uh, boulders that you get in the area. And uh, then secondly, I'll move on to the imagery that you get in the dark zone caves, very, very deep and uh, almost no light, or sometimes no light coming in like the caves in the south of France and the northern Spain. And then thirdly, I'll be looking at open air rock shelters, very much like what we get in the sandstone in southern Africa, again, cliff lines and under shallow shelters. And uh, then uh, lastly, if we have time, I'll be looking at the petroforms or the geoglyphs that you find in Georgia, and these comprise uh, piled stones done in a piled fashion. So basically, you get three physiographic regions where most of the rock imagery occur. First, in the west, you get the region valley where the soluble limestone, where you get a lot of caves, are capped by these sandstone cliffs. Um, then underneath these cliffs, you'll get the caves. And then in the cliffs itself at the base, sometimes you'll get the paintings. So you'll get sometimes in the, more or less the same area, the paintings on the outside and then the imagery in the caves occurring in the same area. Um, then to the east, slightly to the northeast, you get the higher Blue Ridge Mountains that um, are, in, instead of being sedimentary limestone and sandstone, these are igneous rocks. Or, and also meta, mainly metaphoric rocks that have been transformed. And uh, so not very soluble, not many caves. The caves that you do get are kind of rock falls and things like or that rather than so the solution hollows. And so very much wet. And even if they did stuff there, um, it wouldn't last long under those conditions. And uh, then thirdly, you get the Piedmont area, the foothills area down in the south and occupy a lot of northern Georgia and then also the neighboring states. And uh, you'll find that it's a miniature version of the Blue Ridge or the Appalachians where the hills are lower, the climate is far less extreme, it gets hot in the summers, but you don't get the snowfall in the winters. And something, something that all three of these areas do have in common are the, um, the fact that you get these broad river valleys cutting through the areas and they very conducive, very fertile, very conducive uh, to agriculture, to cultivation of domesticated crops. And that's why later on uh, that Native Americans started planting fields of maize like what we know, know as mealies, they know it's as corn and also of beans and squash and sunflower flowers, plants like that and um, also where they could have big villages and then they'll be go out hunting in the woods in the mountains they practiced a lot of burning so the vegetation color cover would have been far less it would have been far more an open environment than what you find today so they do share certain things and if you're not very aware of the geology sometimes if you drive through the area it'll just appear as a monotonous woodland with the odd mountain year and a, a little hill over there, crossing some big rivers, crossing floodplains and smaller creeks. But as I would show that each of these areas um, do tend to contain certain specific types of rock imagery. The ridge and valley 
in the west or the northwest of the state of Georgia, you'll find incised imagery and drawn imagery, and mainly done in black and fine line incised done with sharp stone tools in these dark zone caves, sometimes really deep in. Then in the Blue Ridge, you'll find um, a few of the painted stuff that you always find in the Region Valley, but you'll find the boulders mostly. And then in the Piedmont, you'll find mostly the uh, boulders that are engraved, the petroglyph boulders. Uh, most of the petroglyphs in northern Georgia and western North Carolina in the mountains and also in the foothills are broadline in size, but also pecked. So first you see signs of pecking and then they incised over. So it occurs, as I said, mainly in open boulders and sometimes on uh, bedrock pavements that have been exposed. They've been able to do this because they added water to these things. I know that from conservation, removing incised graffiti that it's very difficult to remove these things unless you add water. And what does water do? It acts as a abrasive medium where the rock particles that are, or the rock dust that are created while you dry pick this, this stuff whilst when you start off, then becomes a, a, an abrasive slurry when you add water. And that adds to the cutting power of the tool that you might be using, usually quartz or some hard rock like that. And it's interesting, as you can see in this photo, that uh, some of these uh, petroglyphs occur in water, literally, that when people produce these, they had to stand in water, whereas others occur in areas where water came out in the past or not far from water. So um, they are associated with water in terms of a physical sense. Then the next group that I'm going to talk about are the dark zone caves. You get the fine line inside stuff done with a sharp tool. And then you also get the dry applied done with charcoal in black mainly. And um, these are mostly wet or damp surfaces in these dark caves. And uh, that means they tend to be a bit softer or the tools of cutting powder. Power is more effective because of the wetness of the surface. Some of it is kind of a thin mud layer that sometimes Native Americans went in, particularly during the Mississippian period and early in the woodland, and maybe even in recent times, and then put the, the, in, inside these uh, muddy surfaces with the fingers. So um, that is an interesting feature of these things that mainly occur northwest in Georgia, northeastern Alabama, and uh, eastern Tennessee. Then the open air shelters, you get paintings mainly done in red, some of them in black, but mainly red and mainly paint, uh, which means ochre powder uh, mixed with water, maybe a binding medium. Uh, I think analysis showed that these things contain very little carbons. In some cases they do, so you can date them. And uh, by adding water, and I think it's even the case with the sand stuff in Southern Africa, you create very fine liquid that can then penetrate the gaps within the rock. In, in sandstone or limestone, it will be the little um, pores that you find in the sedimentary rock. And in granite, it will be the little interstices between the crystals that then get formed. And then later on, in addition to this anchoring effect, you get uh, silica running across the surface and uh, sealing these pigments in. So you get a double bond. So a lot of these things have survived a long time. And their distribution is very much like the distribution of the dark zone caves in the north western part of Georgia. And then finally, the effigies that date to later, much later than people initially thought, they date to the end period of uh, Native American independence in the area between 1540, when De Soto came through with the Spanish and desiccated the Indians, and uh, those surviving Indians then did these uh, image, these uh, part of these stones on bedrock outcrops, a uh, natural bedrock, quartz-rich, milky quartz-rich outcrops on the landscape. And um, until about 1760, when immigrants 
Euro American settlers from the coast and South Carolina came up. And that was the final years of these people. And in that narrow window, they revived a lot of traditional stuff, uh, like they got smoking pipes and things like that, that were very elaborate. And they also did these effigies based on earlier Mississippian um, imagery. So to the track rock petroglyph style is the first one that I'm going to talk about, the petroglyphs on the boulders, the pecked and engraved, and in few cases, historic period, fine line in size. And as I said, it occurs both in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina, Northern Georgia, and uh, then also goes down into the Georgia foothills. And uh, there's some other styles around it, but this style does share certain things. And to date this, even though we haven't got direct dates of these, uh, with a couple of exceptions, we mainly uh, have to rely on relative dating, uh, where Harris diagrams are quite useful, and uh, the transitive and the anti-symmetric rules, uh, where you get no exceptions to that. If you get a large example, large enough, sufficiently large example, then you can start inferring a chronological sequence. But then in addition to that, you look which ones have been truncated by the extraction of soap bo soapstone bowls. And soapstone bowls were extracted in a narrow window dating between 3,800, almost 400, 4,000 4, years ago and 3,000 years ago. We know that because the soot that adheres to these soapstone bowls um, have yielded a lot of direct accelerator mass spectrometry dates and uh, they date in that window. So any engraving or any petroglyph, any design that's truncated by those extraction scars must be older than 3,000 years. We don't know how much older, but definitely older than that. So we've got a horizon marker there. And then another horizon marker are designs that you find in woodland and particularly Mississippian pots that date anything between um, like here, we, for example, I've got uh, middle Mississippian pots, but anything from about a thousand years ago to present, or, or rather to the contact period. And then post-contact uh, imagery sometimes are incised with metal, and metal was only obtained by uh, people, by Native Americans, around about the time of the soda. And this, I don't want to go into detail with you know, deriving this uh, sequence, but here you can see a summary of the sequence. Since then, uh, there are additional petroglyph boulders. I think they're about 24 year. And uh, this is arranged to what kind of motifs occur on the, what are the most popular, the most frequent on any one boulder. So it's kind of, you can see most of them date, date back to the uh, late archaic to around about 3000 years ago. And, some of them date into historic period as far as we can know. And then the woodland period will be in between the Mississippian and the late archaic that we know. Here's another way to illustrate that. The horizon markers here of the late archaics shown in gray, where they occur or they truncated by um, soaps and extraction. And then sandwiched between that and ones of known date with the Mississippian or woodland designs are the early woodland. Uh, features that are mainly, as I would show, uh, vulva shapes, uh, so-called stick figures, and then also uh, various tracks, um, human feet, bear tracks, animal tracks, deer tracks, turkey tracks. And then you get the, the Mississippi in the middle, late woodland Mississippian, and then right at the end, time of European consolidation after 1760, where you get some metal things and historic things being portrayed. So it's a very long tradition of stuff. And it falls in an area where historically, and I think pre-contact pre in pre-contact terms too, you'll find it was inhabited, the mountains, by the Iroquoian-speaking Cherokee people, and then the Muscogee-speaking uh, Creek people. And they only became known by these names later on by the Euro-American settlers. Uh, they share very many uh, attributes. Uh, I think you can talk about a pan-southeastern culture. 
like you can talk about a pan Bantu, Southern Bantu thing, Bantu speaking thing, or a San, a, 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 a Pam San religious belief system. There are particular differences between the areas, but the commonalities are that uh, they both agriculturalists, they both, as I said, uh, since about 2000 years ago, they did, um, they, they cultivated crops, domesticated crops, such as corn or what we call mealies, uh, beans and um, sunflowers. And then also they would go hunting and uh, that would be primarily deer and then also wild turkey and they'll fish. And uh, they will be concentrated in towns on these broad floodplains in all these areas. The Cherokee is more in the mountains, so their settlements tend to be more constricted by the narrow valleys and then the creeks and bigger settlements in the foothills of uh, the more south of the Cherokee and east of the Cherokee. And uh, their beliefs also coincided. They had the green corn ceremony or the busk during harvesting season towards the end of the year, the start of fall. They considered the river as very important, particularly the Cherokee. Uh, they had this uh, Thing where they went to the water and the creeks would also during the bus they will go and wash in the water before they conduct their ceremonies but uh, the Cherokee did it far more and uh, it's interesting that the creeks are far more emphasis on game hunting in the winter than the Cherokees the Cherokees somehow considered game as um, polluted but they still hunted a lot but had a lot of ceremonies to kind of counter the polluting effects of game animals and there are some other similarities, for instance, in their social makeup, the kinship system is, is matrilineal. So you inure it through the female line and also they're matrilocal. So during when they get wed, the husband will go to the female's place. So you get truncated uh, lineage histories because people will be all over the show. And uh, in the oral traditions that are told by males to the anthropologists, you often get, even in the spirit world, where males are having a very hard time because the females, their, their relatives are very much um, ritually powerful and kind of they seem to be bullying the, the husband. And also the husband will be looking after the sister's sons or the sister's children, whereas the mother's brother will be looking after uh, his sister's children. Uh, so the mother's brother is the father of kids, even though he's not the biological father. So there is a matrilineal focus, even though there's a lot of stuff are bilateral. And uh, some of the stuff are kind of um, cross the line. Uh, you get uh, important medicine people that go, like there's a medicine man that goes by the name of Groundhog's mother. So he's got a female uh, designation to it. So like in a lot of cases, uh, the gender identity of these people can change and it's fluid. Um, so the Native American belief system, I think, is important to understand these things. They talk about these things. They forgot a lot, forgot a lot about the details. Although if you go to the central practitioners, the medicine people, they all might share some of the stuff. James Mooney recorded some of the things. He's put a lot of the stuff in the footnotes. Uh, so it's not Obvious, a lot of the stuff is uh, metaphorical, a lot of it's esoteric. And uh, so it takes some time to really make sense of it all. But an important component of this, and I find this even when I go out west with a Paiute uh, in Nevada or the Chumash in California, uh, or up there in the northern parts of um, Nevada and California, uh, some other groups uh, from Columbia Plateau, they would say that spirit beings live below the ground or behind rocks. And when you visit these places, even among the Eastern Shoshone, they will tell you that the spirit beings are always there. And they always know what you do. They can hear what you say. And, uh, but you cannot access them always. And this is also shown by the imagery, because the imagery is not always, as you know, who's worked with rock art. In certain light, these things just disappear. Typically, petroglyphs will stand out with raking light, whereas pictographs, the pigment, will disappear in direct light, or raking light, sorry, the other way around. 
And it's during these times that you can see them that the spirit beings manifest themselves. And people would say that because the medicine people apply these things and people, other people who experience contact with spirit beings, these imagery are very much part of them. So if you kind of damage the imagery, you kind of damage part of these people. And these places are also animated uh, because of uh, these um, associations with uh, these spirit beings. So it is a, I would say, an American, North America wide belief system. I've got reason to believe it goes down to South America if you read the works of Reichel Dalmatov. And uh, you can only go and talk to these people when you go to water among the Cherokee and do specific rituals. Uh, the creeks also, you've got to kind of go in isolation. And on this uh, recreation picture, on this slide, you'll see the two dogs. Dogs are usually, um, they accompany people going to the spirit world. You go to spirit world when you die when you have visions, when you sleep, when you have near death experiences, or when you isolate, you can have these things. And sometimes dogs will be your guides, usually twin dogs, and usually medicine people are twins. And uh, you find that entryways are marked by like in this place, uh, concentric rings or sometimes cross patterns. And uh, then the upper world and lower world is kind of not as physically demarcated as we see. Because sometimes you go into the dark zone caves, and this is in the Caribbean too, where you find upper level beings being only depicted below the ground. Things like birds you find in the dark zone caves, but you won't find them in the above ground petroglyphs. And uh, so you get these inversions, which the for the most part, the spirit world is inverted place, and it's got to be kept separate from the physical world. That's why Native Americans, as a rule, don't like internments to be exposed, and uh, they don't like, um, you know, rock art to be messed with. A lot of them, I know Cherokees, traditional Cherokees, would go to water, cleanse themselves from the polluting effect after they've gone in a cave because they've been in contact with uh ancestral spiritual stuff in there and uh, so um also after you've killed the deer you do stuff and before you do any hunting and uh actions like that uh you you do purification if you're a suit and you want to go and uh, win win over a person uh somewhere else you go to a medicine person where they do sacred formulas and old days they might have gone to a rock art site or a rock. Or, there I make the thing too, I call it the art site, but uh, you go to a petroglyph or pictograph site. And, uh, a, a big thing among the Cherokee is all rivers. And they see the river kind of as an animated being uh, with its head in the mountains and then its feet in the lowlands. So its feet are where usually where these townhouses will be. And uh, the heads are at the top of the stream where the streams come out of the rock so typically and i think a lot of it's metaphorical too uh, they would walk along these catchment areas up these drainages up to the side creeks and streams to where the rocks are and uh, kind of open sesame if they've done the correct rituals if they fasted and so on these um, rocks will open and uh, they will go into the spirit world where they can ask all sorts of favors. It is a very dangerous thing to do. A lot of Cherokees say they don't return. They join the spirit world perfect, permanently. That's why it kind of stays in the realm of medicine people. We have many years of training and people who can hand a, handle the, estate, the, 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 the effects of altered states of consciousness. Uh, so water, interestingly, as I said, physically, you can cut the membrane, that is the rock, easier if you have water, uh, both above ground and below ground where you get the moist surface surfaces. And sometimes you get running creeks also in the caves. And then also by applying 
the paintings to the walls on the outside, you get more permanent and easier application too. And uh, so water is also a spiritual thing where, or psychological where you can make this transfer between the physical and the sacred or the, the altered state, the, the alert and the altered state by um, going to water. There are a lot of stories of Creek medicine people and Cherokee medicine people being in the sweat lodge or being in the townhouse and they do the preparatory things there like they, they would fast. They sometimes will scratch themselves and let some blood and then after some period they'll go to the water and then they say some of them would either transfigure into or face shapeshift into a serpent. And if you're powerful enough, you might even shapeshift into the horned serpent, or also known as the Utena. And it's got a crystal in the top of its head that's very powerful. And uh, or you can confront those snakes, and they might be the medicine people of opposing towns. Both the Creeks and the Cherokees have towns, they're town based, they're not unified um, nations as people talk about the Creek Nation, the Cherokee. Those are, I believe, divide and rule uh, type of uh, labels that people have put on them, uh, like they've done in South Africa. And uh, so it's kind of a vestige, I would say, of colonial uh, language. But these towns, they were separated or they were separated by drainage breaks between uh, drainages. So they were kind of located within certain drainages and uh, they will have slightly different dialects sometimes and uh, slightly different customs. And um, also their material culture might slightly differ. And um, the dialectical differences, I think, being the biggest. But you also see changes in, in the uh, how, what the petroglyphs look like and their distribution, but there are overarching similarities. And as I said, these things are normally close to rivers and of, very often of these townhouses occur on mounds of earlier townhouses, or the townhouses that have been broken down. And uh, also of note is the concentric ring, the internal design of the uh, post, the supporting post of these things. They go, if you walk, look them from directly above, they go in concentric rings. And in the center is the cross and circle motif um, of the fireplace that are, that these fireplaces are reignited during the green corn festivals. And uh, they supposed to be renewal, contact with the sun, which is kind of like a female deity, if you like. I mean, all these deities are ultimately invisible, um, but uh, they are represented, symbolized by the sun and uh, there are stories of medicine people going up and diminishing the power of the sun so that people can, in fact, uh, go into proper trance and not die. Now, I'm, as I said, I'm going to talk primarily about the track rock style. And uh, it is linked in various stories where there's still Cherokee traditions about these rocks, which is mainly Western North Carolina, very far northern part of Georgia, where the last vestiges of the, che the Cherokees lived before they were removed in 1838, and a forced removal east of the river because of, um, of the um, discovery of gold in, in Georgia. Uh, some of them stayed behind, and they hid themselves in different valleys, and uh, they formed the heart of the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians in uh, Western North Carolina, where they've got a casino. Then the other two groups in, in Oklahoma, it's the Kadua Band, and then the one that called themselves, calls themselves the Cherokee Nation. These are the three groups that are recognized by the federal authorities. There's some other groups too. And I don't know whether these divisions are town-based anymore, but certainly in the times of when they produced these things, they were. And they link it, all their linkages, all, all they refer to Judukula or Chulukulu or Tulikula, various pronunciations. Because of the European influence, they call it Judicula. And um, the name basically means uh, he who has slanted, slanted eyes, it refers to specifically. And the slanting in the eyes refers to his pupils that are those of a certain 
cat species like a mountain lion and certain snakes like some of the poisonous vipers. And it means that you can see at night and medicine people with this ability, with cat vision, can see at night, but can also, because they can penetrate the darkness, they can also look at you and uh, read your thoughts. And you get many accounts of medicine people being able to read thoughts, find lost objects, and so on. But Judah Kula is kind of like almost a primal being. He's kind of the, ap uh, the apical medicine person, if you like. And... Uh, He's the master of game. People have to go to him when they want, when the game is scarce or beginning of the hunting season in the fall, when the leaves are off, they'll go to a piece to him. And uh, it's usually at the mountaintop, one of the mountaintop places where he's got his townhouse, which is underneath a mountaintop, a, mount, a, a natural mountaintop, it can access by caves or just a cliff face where the creeks end and you can enter, but only if you're a powerful enough uh, medicine person. So you've got to do all the correct stuff. Otherwise, there's problems because living with Chulukulu are the thunderers, which includes snakes. It sounds like Chulukulu himself, the Judakula, can shapeshift into the horn serpent. It counts like that. Or at least he's got some family. But some of his family are his maternal family. So even Chulukulu can be bullied by, um, his, his, by his wife's mother when he came, became an earthly being and uh, for a while. And uh, his, wa his wife was a powerful Cherokee medicine woman. And um, she could do various things that other Cherokees could not do. And, but she could do almost what Chulukulu could do. Uh, Chulukulu and his wife, they are kind of earthly representations of the primal deity, which is the invisible Kanati, which lives above the sky zone. He's the creator. And also he started creating the deer and stuff, and left them out of the, the, the vault. And then also his wife, Selu, which is sort of the primal shaman, if you'd like, or medicine woman among the Cherokee. And, uh, but these people are beyond the sky vault, sky vault. Some of the stories of them, about them, kind of coincide a lot with the stories of Judah Kula and uh, his medicine wife. And um, so the Cherokees continue with this practice, at least in pre-contact and early contact times until about the 1900s, where um, they would try and appease Judah Kula and um, by going to a townhouse, sometimes which is located on a mound, and uh, then do these rituals where they dance fast and then go to water. They might scratch themselves, but they're not allowed to speak or what they call the war hoop, what that exactly means. I'm not... A, Sure, at this stage, it does help to understand the language. And by this, they can become members of his extended family uh, if you go through the rigors of these uh, initiation ceremonies. And the earliest account of Petroglyphs that we know of is in the late 1700s. And it was told by a Cherokee chief to a Tennessee politician. I think it's just at the time just after the American Revolution, it could even be when it was still a colony of South, uh, in the South. But anyway, uh, the story went that the Cherokees, they tried to appease Judah Kula as they went up to one of his mountaintop abodes. They failed to do so uh, because I think they did the war hoop or they interrupted their fasting. They didn't track, follow all the laws as to what properly to do before you can approached this Judah Kula, and uh, he jumped down and he created this mound. And he said, from now on, you guys will approach me through the mound because you can't do things properly if you don't prepare. And this mound and the townhouse will uh, enable you um, to do the proper rituals. And one of these mounds is the Peachtree Creek Mound that's been dug up or desecrated during the 1930s, during the Works Progress. Uh, administration or the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, efforts 
uh, during the um, depression where work was created for people. And uh, they found numerous floors of townhouses or temples called by the Spanish on this. And this is apparently from Peachtree Town or from a town close by that Judicula then sent, set off with his family. And uh, then he went up the, what they know known today as Brastown Creek. Brastown is a, is a name derived from Cherokee language, which means copper. So he went up this creek and uh, on his way, there's some other stories that this happened in North, Western North Carolina in the Pigeon River Valley there, but this is the uh, Brastown Creek Valley. And um, today, or in, in pre-contact times, when the first Euro Americans came there, the Choice Toey Trail ran partly along it. And as his wife rested on the rocks, she menstruated. And the blood of the menstruation, she gave rise to two twins. And um, their little feet and hands and things left imprints on the rock. And that's what one sees in some of the older petroglyphs. And Judicule himself, when he went up to Brastam Bald, which is the close, the, the tallest mountain in Georgia, uh, which is today known as the house where little people live, uh, where the Forest Service have to ask Cherokee permission if they do any alterations, otherwise the little people get upset, the extended family of Judicula and his wife. Um, that's where he went up to. But before he reached it, he left his imprints at Track Rock Gap. There are about eight rocks there, and um, this is a photo of Creek Indians also having an interest in the place, visiting the, play, uh, the, the, the site, the, the petroglyph complex with members of the Forest Service. We did a lot uh, to uh, open the place to the public. And then also the Georgia Department of Transportation and uh, then also academics and so on. So it's kind of a collaborative effort. It was, it was first covered by these greats, but then they put in psychological barriers. This is a photograph of the tallest or the biggest, uh, the most busiest rock at Judicula's Rock. And this is where Judicula left his foot in print. And there are also stories of, it was either Kanati, the, the creator being, or Judicula's kids, the two naughty twins. The one twin was really naughty. They're both shamans, both medicine people. And uh, the naughty one, convinced the other one to come and follow him and lift up a rock and out come running the animals and they left their tracks in the rock. And uh, we already know that uh, Judicula's wife sat on the rock and conceived children while menstruating because it's the spirit world, things are kind of reversed. And uh, you can see the rocks are the nexus or the nexi or whatever the plural of the word is, or the, the, the veil that separates the spirit world uh, from the physical world. And that's where the animals from the spirit world emanate. That's where babies ultimately come from. They do know that babies come from physical human beings, but there is also this notion that game and people do ultimately come from the old underground. Now, if you look at that in the previous one, it's, 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 it's very complicated. There's a lot going on, a lot of overlapping. But once you start looking at, as I said, through the Harris method or the overlap method, you find that these things are, and particularly the meanders and cupules and, and, and simple circles, they are truncated by later soapstone extraction which, as I said, dates between about 3,800 years and 3,000 years, 3,000 years of cutoff. So they might, must be older than 3,000. I don't have an example of actual cutout, uh, but on other rocks in this complex, you do get this cutoff of the things that they truncated. But here they truncated by later imagery. As you can see, the vulva shapes coming in during the woodland period because they're always on top where they co-occur with uh, at least with the meanders and uh, with the um, circle, they're always later. You can see some of them have got extension lines below, which could be designate the uh, menstruation of Jericula's wife. And uh, then you get feet being added. And um, 
and also animal tracks during the woodland. Uh, I left one out there, I skipped one where um, also little stick figures are added mainly during the woodland. And then during the middle Mississippi, and you get these cross in ring designs being added, and sometimes some of the vulva shapes are being modified. And you get those in pottery that's been dated from middle Mississippi to even the late Mississippi. So these things could even go back to the middle woodland. Uh, but I think in that area, the cross and ring design are more uh, Mississippian. And in late Mississippi, you find more cupules being added and some fine line inside stuff. <coughs> Sorry. And um, cupules, just a word about cupules in this area. Uh, they're the earliest and the latest. They go right through the sequence. And uh, we find, in terms of the ethnography, the Cherokee don't say much about it from what we know. Um, but we know from other ethnographies that uh, they chip these things, uh, they pick at it. And of course, if you add water, you, you speed up the process. And um, then you take the rock dust and you imbibe it, and it's full of trace minerals. And it helps people, it reduces acid, the calcium and magnesium, the trace elements. And then also it's got other trace elements like zinc and copper. I think some of those are dietary supplements for women who are pregnant. And uh, Couples were also used for to mix medicines in. Uh, some of the straight lines were used to pour, even today, Cherokee will go there, some of the med medicine practitioners, and they'll pour water over it, and they'll catch the water that's flowed over the rock at the bottom, and uh, they'll drink that, and they say that contains medicine. But not everybody does it. A lot of the Cherokee, like some other Native Americans, uh, they kind of reticent to go to these places because it's thought that you've got to know the spiritual power there and you've got to do all the cleansing and stuff. Of course, it's not, it's only a small proportion of the people, but it's still there, some of those beliefs. And, um, and across the board, I also find that it's the place that's important rather than the imagery. Uh, the imagery is important, but it's how people behave at a place. And it's the plants that grow there. It's the animals that are there. It's the water that comes out from underneath the rock that people are sometimes standing when they produce these things. The, they are important, as important as the images. So some Native Americans say it's okay. I know out in the Bay Area in California, they say it's okay if the imagery goes. Other people are a bit more concerned about it. So it varies from individual to individual and from group to group. This is just a summary of what's going on at Track Rock with the superposition, uh, where the soapstone thing comes through, and then sandwiched between the soapstone and the cross and ring, the woodland period stuff, and then you get the cross and ring uh, always being on top of the sequence, but then so a few couples on top of that. As I said, Judicula stopped started walking with his wife where the Brasthand Creek meets the Iwasi River. And that is a very powerful spot for the Cherokee. It's called Akui, and it means the big place, the great place, or place where it's strong. It's also known as the Southern Gate, and that's where you go to the south. Uh, Judah Kula's rock that I'll get to next is called the Eastern Gate, where you go to his lodging in the west, on the east, sorry. So this place in the water has got petroglyphs. And... Uh, Sorry, these petroglyphs uh, are more of the kind that you find in the dark zone caves. They include these two dogs earlier. I don't know whether you remember, I'll show you the two dogs that help people to cross the raging rivers uh, that sometimes you get in creek uh, stories that divides the spirit world or the physical world from the spirit world. And everybody who dies and who can afford it gets a medicine person then to do various rituals to help you over to the other side. And medicines and so on are then placed with that person in a grave and it's closed up and you don't open it again because in doing so, you open a Pandora's box. So it's the, these worlds have got to be separated and these images give you kind of brief glimpses sort of what, of what could be a chaotic world inside, they brief glimpses of what's culturally mediated on the rock surface. And you can see these rocks are 
end of these particular ones in the river, sometimes uh, at high water level, you've got to go in a canoe to reach them or at least swim. And uh, certainly these people got their feet wet. When they pick these things, they have plenty of water to help them speed up the process. There's a lot of cup hills here. As I said, also to mix medicines, people would have come here. You can see some of the cup hills go into the, uh, into the imagery. And also something that I forgot to mention that's kind of past pertinent per 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 here is that these towns, they were defined by the major linguistic group who occupied it at any one time. And there are accounts of early European American, Euro American people coming in, observers who wrote down what they saw and experienced. And they'll visit a town, say, in northeastern Alabama, and it's got a Cherokee name, because the majority of people there are Iroquois and speaker. Next time, a couple of years later, he comes, then he finds it's got a change name, it's a Creek name, a Muscogee name. And it's because those people then become, uh, the, they've become the majority inhabitants since. And uh, we know in this area where these two rivers meet at the confluence of Brassan Creek and the Awasi River, you find that they are Natchez Indians, they are Yuchi Indians, and not some of these people were ritual practitioners among the Cherokee. So that could account for some of the anomalous imagery here. But this is a place, the pools here, where they are submerged townhouses and also where the horned serpent resides. Uh, this is some more Mississippian period imagery, uh, which includes a guy with a big uh, eared person, some snakes that also help uh, people during war. This area is known in the Murphy area currently. Even today, some Cherokees recall that uh, some warrior type of Cherokee people live here. So a lot of war medicine occurred in this area. People did preparatory rituals for raids and maybe came afterwards and did cleansing ceremonies. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you could see circled is a person, a little depiction of a figure with six fingers. Sometimes it's up to seven fingers. So among Cherokee ritual practitioners, uh, core re religious medicine people, uh, or people who really know the Cherokee traditions very well, they'll say that is the maker's mark of Julukula, Julukulu, the master of game that made his imprint. And so wherever you see that, it shows you that Judah Kula was here. So this is one of the places where he kind of made his presence known. Now to jump to Judah Kula Rock, that's named after Judah Kula and um, the master of game. And this is not far from where the Cherokee, the current reservation is and the, what they call the Kuala boundary in Western North Carolina and the mountains there where people from Atlanta and so on go gambling. And um, so it is still part of Cherokee tradition. Uh, I think as a result of being so close to where they still live, but there are accounts of people coming from Oklahoma uh, to do rituals here. And uh, through concern, Cherokees came together with the Forest Service, the North Carolina State Historical Office, the local residents of Caney Creek, and uh, the various other entities, and uh, you know, through excavations, proper recordings, so on, came up with a plan. Had landscape people coming in, and designed this walkway or boardwalk, whatever you'd like to call it, so people can view it from a distance. And uh, in the back there, you see the Cane Creek, uh, the Cane, the River Cane, sorry, uh, that Caney Creek gets its name from. Uh, that's got ritual importance to Native Americans in various ways, also practical and made baskets of it and so on. Yeah, you can see opening day with some of the Cherokee there viewing it. Uh, the interpretive signage there all in Cherokee and the syllabary that was developed in the 1820s by Sequoia. Uh, Richard Guest uh, was his uh, Western name. And Jinakula Rock, you can see again a lot of uh, pickings and engravings, some straight lines which apparently designates rivers. And uh, various things got to do with Judicula and his antics. A lot of the accounts are kind of hilarious. Um, I find that Native Americans, when they talk about spirit world, the spirit beings like Coyote out west, they're not very serious. There's a lot of humor in it. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of, I think, sometimes a disconnect where you get Euro American people and they uh, become kind of serious when they talk about these things. And, they can't understand that, that some of these stories are kind of 
bordering on the edge of uh, you know explicit content and so on. But anyway, you can see also here the with the extraction areas where uh, they want to extract soaps and bowls, but they left the blanks behind. It was aborted before they extracted the soaps and bowls there at the lower uh, right hand side. You could see the imprints of Judah Kula, uh, there, the seven fingered hand, where people went up to his domain. They didn't stop at the rock as was required, where they should do certain rituals. They should go to the river there at the Caney Creek and wash themselves, and they didn't do it. They went directly up, and Judah Kula appeared to them in a bad vision, I could say in Euro-American terms. Uh, they believe it was actually happened. And uh, he pursued them. He changed into a snake. And then when they reached the bottom, he, he sort of changed into thunder and lightning, and he came down, and he landed on this rock, and he made this imprint with his hand and seven fingers being a medicine person. And with his sharp finger that he also incised the wooden post in his sweat lodge, he incised this rock to say, if you cross this boundary, which is the Little Caney Creek up there too, this is the Takasigi River, but the Little Caney Creek up there, if you cross here without doing the proper stuff, I will, you will get killed. So uh, that's kind of a story uh, that could be true or not, but uh, which is sort of like metaphorical of things that people need to do uh, when they go up and visit Judicula. One of the places that they would probably would have started was here at Kuluwe Town, which was on the campus, the current campus of the University of Western North Carolina. And there's still a mound left there where these multiple townhouses were built. And uh, as I said, townhouses are the launching pad for these altered states journeys. Uh, where people do prolonged dance, dancing, um, uh, also fasting, and then ultimately going to water. And then they will travel up the Caney Creek, first the Takasigi River, then the Caney Creek, all the way up to Tennessee Bald, and also Judicula's Courthouse, where he had his townhouses. Sometimes the townhouses are twins, so maybe this is why they've got two up there. And on the way, there are Judicula Rock, and there's also Brinkley Rock before they moved it. And uh, that's a Judicula rock that these people had to stop. There was a village nearby of people who took care of the rock. Later on, and maybe even during his use, people came and they mixed medicines in some of the larger holes. As I said, they pour water. They created the water that ran down to create medicine. They caught it on the downside. The medicines were tobacco that they put in ochre. They would also sometimes they could come together and the elders and the people knowledgeable about tradition and medicine people will with the cane creek, the tip of the cane creek, they won't touch it themselves. They will point to the rock and they'll point to certain things. And then the, the, the people present will shout out uh, in amazement at cert certain things that have been pointed out. Some of the stuff they say refers to heavenly bodies. Some of the stuff refers to the earthly ground plane surface, and some of them refer to the underworld. So the rock represents all of these things squished together. It's kind of a map of, of worlds combined. This is on the other side, Jalukuda's townhouse. There are apparently some caves in there. It's just kind of cracks in the rock where they say met some people walk up vertically to get to it. Here is the sequence of Judicula rock dating back to the late archaic and uh, then going up to thin line size done with metal tools in the post-contact period. The very earliest, I just want to quickly recap on the um, sequence of designs. The basins where people probably grinded stuff, cup hills, as I said, to extract minerals and also to mix things, and the meanders. The meanders, we're not really sure what they are, um, and they could be trails, as some of the people interpret these as trails. And these things can have multiple meanings. I mean, they not only multiple meanings because they're commonalities between things, uh, they, they're common metaphors that you can derive from stuff, but um, also just in terms of the literal meanings, they could be uh, different, but then ultimately, uh, 
the metaphors and the meanings, the significance would be related in one way or another. But these sites were used. They weren't just made and then abandoned. They were added to through time. And I would say that each edition was a comment on earlier stuff. And uh, so as you go into the woodland, you get the vulva shapes being added at the different sites from the spirit world. Then uh, the, the, the feet, the animal tracks, the deer tracks, the bear tracks, the bird tracks, and even the hands, the claw-like hands of Judakula. They, uh, they refer to him and uh, all the people adhere to his um, movement who would ensure the, uh, the game is present. And, and this, even though it dates to the woodland, it still resonated with people during the Mississippian and later. And uh, then the figures, they're basically woodland, as I said, because some of them are overlapped by uh, footprints and uh, tracks. And so I don't know about boulders. I think in some cases, yes, too. And then Mississippian figures later on. So definite Mississippian things that you get in Mississippian vessels and so on. And some of them are depictions of Judah Kula, some of not. And then concentric circles. Uh, they could represent whirlpools townhouses and curled up snakes. And to Cherokee, these things, and to some of the creeks, these things are similar because sometimes within the townhouse, the benches surrounding it can become a, a can become a, 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 not a, if the pythons among the vendor, but it can become a snake, a serpent uh, that surround the ritual area. And sometimes these things do become whirlpools and you can get sucked in through the central fire or you can, people in, uh, a canoe above these sunken townhouses can be sucked through the skylight or people go through the skylight in a, a journey. And the cross and circuit circle, it's the cardinal directions, the sun, the female deity, a central fireplace, it could also be a vulva. Some of the vulvas have been upgraded to that. And it can mean some other things too. But I think if you all take it together, it sounds like these places are the next eye of uh, fertility, access to the spirit world, and uh, where you can ensure that gra uh, game would be plentiful. You can ensure that you'll have success during raids. You can have success during courtship, and you can have success when you're expecting a child. And uh, there is other endeavors, endeavors. Also, if I have the time, I'll get to the ball game. And then the straight line, some of them done in Mississippi. I'm not exactly sure. They may be there to accentuate certain boundaries, certain connections. Yeah, the, the, the Cherokees will tell you that whereas the open air petroglyph bowlers are where medicine people went, only the very, very powerful medicine people ventured underground. And you had to do that because these are dark with river cane torches and sometimes with cane, oh, sorry, with pine torches. And uh, they did relays of these things going into the caves uh, where they had like um, beforehand where they could use the torches as the one gets extinguished. And like a cigarette, when you smoke it, you've got to tip off the ash. Sometimes to keep the rubber cane from glowing, you've got to press it against the side of the, the cave of the tunnel and that leaves little smudges behind little circles. And those are the things sometimes they date. And uh, as I said, some of the stuff in charcoal. So they've got good um, dates or relatively good dates of chronology for caves. And as I said, most of it's done in black. And outside the, the, the cave here, you can see some river cane, which is special among them. And also mainly in Northern Georgia, Northwestern Georgia, some Northeastern Alabama and then eastern Tennessee. Yeah, the dates show they go way back to the terminal woodland about 5,800 years ago. Uh, some of the engravings might go back that time. And uh, then they go right through through the woodland, a lot of dates in the Mississippian. And uh, you see they get quite elaborate and the motifs are those that you find in the Mississippian period. Charcoal in the left bottom corner here is basically uh, done with a chunk and this dates to about 5,000 years ago. All this with game, maybe it's got to do with extraction game. Then the finger, finger and stick incision in the mud, as I, uh, earlier on the soft mud, 
uh, that you can just do with your um, finger and or sometimes with a sharp stick where this is of a stick ball player this dates to the woodland it's really a big figure some of these things are taller than life than real figures and uh, then you get this in a cave with very hard limestone where they incised a little circle with a lot of detail the size of it's not more than 10 centimeters in diameter so very small very detailed very focused and you have to have fire light burning at a long time to do that and uh, what they call these toothy smile things and they're usually associated with burials it's just the head and then it's associated with beads and uh, the, the te teeth and the in the mouth sometimes with closed eyes or empty eyeballs and then things coming from the mouth and then finally you get the Cherokee celebrity done in charcoal pencil or sometimes just in size in suit and the celebrity usually uh, includes or mostly or almost exclusively includes uh, sacred or magical incantations to, done by medicine people up in, in the Georgia area and uh, northeastern Alabama, there was a, a, a notable post-contact medicine person called Goose, or The Goose, and he did a lot of these things. And uh, there's uh, stuff that the Cherokee do not want to translate. Uh, a lot of it's got to do with the stickball game, so it shows a continuation. And I think it also says something about picture writing, that these things are picture writing. Uh, that the stickball figure in this dog zone cave in Tennessee, dating to the woodland, uh, shows that these ceremonies prior to stickball have a time depth and it goes right up to even after Euro Americans were in the area. And what, what I find most fascinating is the one celebrity that was, I think, either in size or done in charcoal that they couldn't decipher. They thought, what the heck was this? And uh, somebody realized these things were done in reverse. So they used a little mirror and it said something to the spirit beings behind the rock. So if you're still doubtful about oral traditions and what I'm saying, I think that's kind of QED to my mind. And um, so, just to go to the stickball figure, a uh, uh, photograph here, uh, shamans, it was very much a contest between medicine and people who took the stickball figures to order where they had to fast, they had to be scratched and to be in isolation, no contact with women. But during the day of the game, the women would come out matrilocal after all, they representatives of the town. Uh, the medicine person would do a drum there and uh, you can see the black play, players in the background. These were serious business. Uh, at preparatory, beforehand, the medicine people also dream. Sometimes they'll have little artifacts with them, and they will attack the opposition town's coach or medicine person in their dreams, and sometimes with these little artifacts. So it is a battle fought in the spirit world as much as in the physical world. And the whole town will come together. There will be children, and they'll play this game. And this game was brutal. It lasted the whole day, and sometimes people did get killed. And for that reason, I guess, they called it the little brother of war. It's kind of like uh, Olympic Games on steroids. So this is what they talked about sometimes in the dark zone caves. Um, okay, I can, I can finish here uh, before I get to the, um, the stuff that's more kind of like the things that we are used to in open shelters, the paintings. We, we, which incidentally are done in red, which is symbolic of blood, life, whereas the, the stuff in the dark zone caves are uh, symbolic of um, black and death. And people have said of these imagery uh, that uh, you can see here how big they are with Alan Kressler, who's done a lot of work. Uh, they, they, they occur in various places. Some of them occur in the Blue Ridge, but most of them occur in the Region Valley. Uh, very uh, diagrammatical. And then they continue into the Mississippian where they go high on cliff bases and cliff faces and things like that. And uh, Cherokees have told me that those things are as if 
seeing those things as if you're looking at the medicine person. It is an extension of that person. So if you go over there and harm that person, then you harm a medicine person. So a lot of these places are closed down to public visitation. Others they've kind of made over open for uh, presentation, but caves, dogs on caves, very narrow. Um, it's only spelunkers and people with uh, permission that can go in there. And then finally, if I can just quickly finish this, this is quite a bird of a different feather, if you like, uh, these piled bird effigies, of particularly raptors in this drainage area of the upper Oconee area in the Georgia foothills. And uh, they date to very late. And uh, you can see they've piled these things in the, it's post-contact. I mean, it's after DeSoto came through the area and before native, uh, before Euro-American people came. So it's that window between 1540 AD and 1760, uh, where the Indians interacted with Euro-Americans, but in this area didn't even accept the tools. So dating is kind of deceptive because you look for European tools. These guys chose, like the Kudua Cherokee, to get away from European and to espouse everything European in this particular area. Other areas, of course, the just reverse were true, where people really acquired European tools and stuff like that. So you see that the different farmsteads, these upland farmsteads came together and uh, they took one cremated individual, just a few pieces of bone, maybe some artifacts from the middle archaic, and uh, then accidentally with, might, that they might have dropped or some potsherds that date to the late Mississippi to the post-contact period, but still Native American independence in the area, uh, just before they were expanded, you find with those cremations. So they had this massive effort to put just one individual under these bird-shaped things. And the one area south of where I work is this thing that they reconstructed. It's a bird with spread out wings. It's a far neater shape than what they found it. It's not visible from ground level. You've got to go up like the Nazca lines to see it. And uh, drone photography and cl repeated clearing allowed us to see the one to the right. And they basically quartz rich milky white stone that glow in the dark when you walk in it or when you stack it in the, in the twilight. These things glow. And there's evidence that some of them weren't ever finished, that people came back and they kind of ritually, add, ritually added basket loads of these things. And as they added them, they probably the quartz would release this glow in uh, the afternoon sun or when in the dusk. And uh, so th they were centered on these natural quartz, nice veins, nice as, as they spell it, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S -S. And um, so these formed the backbones. And you can see the cremation is almost where the stomachs of these things should be. The area that we worked in, the birds got their wings turned backward and the heads aren't really kind of merged with the body and the, the tails are more rounded. Uh, this is the site we, one of the sites we investigated where we found it's going to be turned into a park now on the county. These are six of the bird-like shapes we found, very shallow, but they are empty. The baskets, the basket loads of fist-sized fist stones were empty in these depressions. Excavations showed that they weren't just piled on the surface. Uh, they excavated down into subsoil, which is not too far below the ground. And uh, then to form a template with uh, straight edges, so they can then empty these stones. But through years, you know, with deer walking across the people, tree tip ups, all that sort of things, they became scattered and blurred. So some of the reconstruction is a bit speculative, but I think there is some of the consistent recurrence of these turn back wings, which you also get at places like Painted Bluff that we know is Mississippian, and also the, the copper artifacts that they did out of Lake Copper in the Southeast with uh, rounded tails like this and wing back. And it's a slightly different town area in this part of the Oconee River than the towns that where you get the spread out uh, birds. There are two of these spread out birds that they know of at this stage, probably a third. And then we know of these six or so up in the area. So they're not very common. And then finally, it's a result of a sequence of burials where they probably took from all inspection 
uh, by anatomists and so on, medical people, is that these people suffered from syphilis or they had cancerous growth in the bones. They were sick individuals physically, which were then exhumed and then deboned and uh, also rather than placed on these um, rock outcrops, uh, cremated and deboned and sometimes broken up with very, very elaborate bird smoking pipe effigies, the most elaborate smoking pipes I know of in the United States, and then also these small, small little bowls. And that's what we found ending up in the, underneath in the belly of this big bird that they also found at the Rock Eagle uh, further south. And uh, so even though these things are along the river, they tend to be a low, high-lying areas, and they definitely associated with fire, trans, transformation uh, by a fire. So that kind of puts them um, separate from the, uh, the water thing. So I think basically I've covered what um, the ethnography in this particular area, I think the main points that were of interest to me. But thanks for listening in and thanks for your patience. Yanni, that's absolutely um, incredible stuff. And uh, for I think I think for most of us here, it's uh, entirely new, even with my rudimentary understanding of North American rock art. Uh, I think sort of uh, 80 percent, 90 percent of that was was all new to me. So I was absolutely um, riveted. And so, um, I, as I said earlier, I've got a string of questions. I'm not going to ask, uh, ask them all. You answered a couple of them right at the end. Um, but I had a, 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 I'll ask some of the, the hopefully the more sort of incisive ones that I've got here. Um, but I have to th say um, just my, you know, um, observation yet again with your presentations, the, the graphics, you've just got this incredible graphic talent and um, your graphics, especially in the tables, really do help to illustrate some very complex information as they do in your a lot, a lot of your publications. Um, uh, where you sort of tease apart. Um, I remember some of your, your stuff from the Baja California stuff where you're teasing apart the um, and the, the Harris diagrams with the with the uh, sequences there. Um, so uh, uh, one of my questions was that um, so you, you answered the one about damaging the imagery and damaging the people. So uh, that was that was interesting. And then I was I was struck by the inverted world thing. I hadn't appreciated that it was quite such a pan Northern American thing because it reminded me of the stuff that David Whitley obviously has published for the making rain in the desert with the the guy the 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 ritual specialist with the quail feathers on their heads and you go to the driest driest part of places like death valley and then you you find the rainmakers there because on the other side it's of course the wettest place um so i, I we saw a lot of that in your talk i thought um and then I wanted to ask you, the dogs next to the concentric rings, was that something that you yourself had related to the ethnography? It sounded like it was something that you had observed in the ethnography and then you'd found this place and then you had concentric circles and the two dogs. Was it you that put the two and two together there? Well, I've got the fortune of knowing people uh, working in Western North Carolina there's a linguist, Tom Belt, he's a traditionalist. He could even be a medicine person, I don't know, but he really knows his stuff and esoteric stuff. Um, and then there's a, an archeologist called Brett Riggs. And then I've also got a, uh, he's at the University of Western North Carolina. Then I've got a friend, Scott Ashcraft at the Forest Service. Uh, they have regular contact with the Cherokees. And um, so it's basically via Scott that I hear what Brett and um, Mr. Belt has to say, and Tom Belt. And uh, so the dog thing I recorded, uh, some other people recorded too, but I think I've got the only tracing of it and stuff, you know, where you've done very careful observation. And uh, there are very few references of dogs, but I think David Lewis Wins rightly points out that, and I think Hammond took also, also often said that it's not the frequency, it's the oddness of stuff. 
and obscurity of stuff that sometimes give you just sort of the gem that's hidden, uh, what David calls the nugget. So dogs are very infrequently me uh, m uh, mentioned, but if you look at the ethnography where they are mentioned, and especially in the creek ethnography, they do say that they are animals of passage, they accompany, and uh, but I think some of the stuff that you know they are two dogs is maybe my inference that you know they link up with the shamans, the medicine people who are twins typically, but not always, and. Um, so it is, um, you know, via my connection with these people working in North Carolina and a bit of my own reading uh, and just listening to what Native Americans say, you know, that led me to that conclusion. You also get burials with Native Americans buried with dogs. But it's not, a, I mean, if you pick up a book, it's not going to jump in your face. I mean, it's, uh, I think even that person who did that painting, you know, must know more than we give that person. <laughs> I kind of found it. Well, on well, internet, but, that was, uh, that was going to be my, my, my comment on it was that uh, it seems to be an ideal opportunity for publication, perhaps co co-authored with the um, Native American medicine person that you were with and the other chap that you mentioned, perhaps, you know, to, 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 to flesh it out and uh, you know I don't know if it's the kind of thing that they would be um, willing to offer because sometimes these things you know off are sort of offered in passing or maybe in confidence and if they want it published but it sounds like an ideal opportunity to get that genuine um, ethnographic interview material um, across uh, it it just struck me as being really um, valuable stuff and, 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 and fresh and, and new stuff that I definitely hadn't seen before. Well, like everything else is this two edge, two edge sword. Um, you know, up until the 90s or so, it was really frowned upon, ridiculed, um, ostracized to look at the ethnography. It was speculation. Indian stories, just so stories, as they said. And uh, so, uh, you know, I came from South Africa. I did not have anything vested in the academic community. And of course, South Africa, we have good ethnography and we had good teachers like uh, David Lewis Williams and Tom Huffman uh, that allowed us to, to look at these things in Hammond Turk. And, uh, and, you know, of course, you know, being friends with David Whitley helped a lot. And uh, it's just am amazing the potential of these things to um, add new light to, to, to see things that were maybe in full sight but didn't have any significance. It's like seeing a fire or standing around a fire and not realizing that it's going to create light at night or it's going to cook your food, transform your food. Just looking at fire, something there. And I think uh, this allowed him also, especially the thing of the, the world of spirit beings. And uh, I think a lot of sociological things, including Levi Strauss, have fallen short of that. That this society includes spirit beings, just as if these things are there, they cannot always be seen, but you act because you know that they're going to have an effect on you. So, you know, if you look at relations of production and you look at kinship networks and, and things like that, you have to take that, I think, into consideration. And it's not always going to be obvious archaeologically, like a lot of things aren't. I mean, people would say, you know, subsistence, you know, you can see everything. That's not true. And it's the same year. Um, so, uh, but the other side of the, 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 the sword or, you know, the notion of things contained within themselves, their own opposite or whatever, is the fact that we've neglected to bring in Native Americans directly. Um, there are various reasons for it. Uh, there are some Native Americans now that are getting or have already got PhDs in rock art studies, which is a good thing. And um, they, I think, they are being more included in publications like that of Jan Simic. And they can also say the advantage of having people directly, they could say what they're comfortable with and what not. And especially, you know, where one has gone maybe off the, you know, off the track there, you know, where one gets things wrong. I'm sure I've got things wrong during this presentation. Uh, 
you know, but it's an academic exercise. We've always got to accept that, you know, things will change and things can be built upon. But I think to come back to where I was saying about the paradigm shift, which have happened now, mm. uh, that you listen to Native Americans and uh, you can almost see it's the reversal of the colonial frontier, uh, that there is not that issue anymore. And uh, the Native Americans, I go to Cherokee conference uh, annually, and the Native Americans I work with out west, they probably see that I slip up and I do stupid stuff, but they kind of, you know, laugh it off. And they could see that, um, you know, we are um, serious about stuff and we care about what they do. And I think that's important for them. I, I, I get the impression also removing graffiti is that often they're not so upset about graffiti, but it's the things that occur with applying the graffiti. People just not acting appropriately, you know, caught on cameras doing all sorts of stuff that you would not see, you know, publicly who don't want to see. And uh, that's what really upsets them you know, when people harm animals and stuff associated with areas. So, um, so there is this kind of contradictory thing where one does stuff, but one's got to be careful of not overstepping and putting too much maybe of a Euro-American stamp on it without due consultation. So I envisage in the future that maybe before I do a book thing or whatever, I will try and include some of my acquaintances, Cherokee friends, and uh, see how that that comes that works out. Absolutely, it, it it just struck me as a perfect opportunity for co 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 authorship and consultation and all those good things. And as you say that, thanks to you and David and others, and I know Jamie has written a bit about the fact that you know he was very surprised about the lack of use of ethnography when he first started, even back in the early two thousands. Uh, that 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 that. Um, that, that that's no longer a problem and and we're seeing a lot of um co-authored um papers articles and books coming out of north america with surprise surprise native american um co-authors and authors um and so yeah it's it's really really nice to see what the the impression i get was that this was only the tip of the tip of the iceberg um if if there aren't any other questions i just had one small one and that was at the track rock, uh, the metal mesh structures. What are the metal mesh structures over the rock? Is that a conservation measure or what was that? Yeah, they were put in in 1967 and they were removed in 2010. And uh, they were to protect people from scratching on the things and doing graffiti. But people could reach between the rocks and do it anyway. Mm. And uh, also when you took photographs, it looked horrible. You know, people were, they tried to pry open the bars with the car jacks and stuff like that. And uh, also the rust from the the bars, you know, discolored the rock. But I have to say that soapstone is incredibly resilient. I mean, that is track rock that you saw that, but the Judicula rock people did all sorts of stuff with it. And Strangely enough, the things, the, the abrasion that people, you know, using at this jumping ramps for their motorbikes, for the all-terrain bikes and vehicles and stuff like that, uh, kind of erase some of the shallow graffiti because the substance is harder than you think. It takes a commitment to engrave and peck into those things. So the pre-contact Native Americans did a good job making it really deep and those things survived. Uh, in spite of good efforts to try and save it and a lot of years of use and abuse. So they're still around. And um, it goes with uh, what I always think of these things, where we still see these things, the natural conditions favor them being there, unless land use or people visitation or whatever has changed. And then it's important to see what that is. And uh, again, deterioration by itself is maybe not always a bad thing. One's got to then consult with uh, relevant Native American groups, whoever the landowners or might be, the stakeholders, and then go on from there. 
Fantastic. Um, that is, I mean, it's just all fascinating stuff. I mean, I think I think you could, we're going to have to invite you back for a, a talk on conservation. We're going to have to invite you back for a talk on uh, your graphic technique. Uh, we're going to have to invite you back for another one on just those cremations, the open air stuff. I mean, we, the list goes on. So I hope that at some point we can entice you back to talk to us again. And so it just remains for me to say thank you very, very much for uh, tuning in and giving us such a fantastic talk. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, for chairing the session so professionally.